you get a full house and some. <laughs> it's so great to have, have Bob back. So good afternoon, I'm Gretchen Spreitzer. I'm the faculty director of the Center for Positive Organizations and uh, we're thrilled to have this very special workshop today with Bob um, entitled Becoming Who You Really Are, Learning, what to, Learning to Do What Organizations Cannot Do. Um, we especially welcome any of you who are here for the first time. If you're here for the first time, will you raise your hand? Great, wow, it's wonderful to have you. We hope you'll come back. Um, for those of you that are watching on the live stream, we welcome you too. And we encourage you to share um, that this will be archived um, on our center website. If you have nuggets you want to share with other people. And again, we encourage you to come back um, again for a future session. I'll tell you a little bit about those at the, at the end of today. Um, so as the Center for Positive Organizations, we're really trying to do the science to understand how to make organizations great, how to help people develop their full potential, um, and how to help organizations be generative forces for good. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors. You see, um, well, there's another slide that comes up. You'll see some of them there. Um, two of them are right here in the front row here, Paul and Diane Jones, who have been um, longtime supporters of Positive Race. And we thank the Sanger Leadership Center, the Tauber Institute for Global Operations, and Zaluri Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies. So without further ado, let me do a quick introduction of a man who really needs no introduction. Um, Bob is phenomenal in a number of ways. First, as a scholar. Uh, he's a distinguished professor here at the University of Michigan, but he's also an exceptional teacher and a mentor. In fact, I was counting up the years that Bob has been a mentor to me uh, way back as a doctoral student, and I will say the number is getting close to 30. I won't <laughs> tell you how many years it's close to 30, but almost three decades. Um, second, Bob is an innovator. He's always thinking outside the box, and in fact, for those of you that were excited to come back and do the high quality connection exercise at the beginning, Bob's breaking the rules. We're not doing that today because he has something else up his sleeve. Um, but he's always encouraging us to have that 2% more courage to do um, the important thing, the right thing. But third, Bob is also extraordinary as a wonderful colleague and friend. He radiates energy. This is him after coming off a flight from London. I think I would be under the table asleep. Bob radiates energy. He's always nudging us to get out of our comfort zone and to become better. And like many of you, I, I can say um, very clearly that my life is better having known Bob, both as a person as, and as a scholar. So with that, please give Bob a warm welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's energizing just to be with you. That's where that energy comes from. Um, Gretchen mentioned this ritual we have of doing a high quality connection exercise prior to each of the talks. Um, I asked her today if we could do it as part of the talk and do it just a little bit differently because it fits what I want to accomplish. So here's what I'd like to suggest um, in terms of making this high quality quick connection. Last week I was at a business school in another part of the country and I was meeting with faculty and that's always a challenge. Um, and um, we focused on the notion that uh, comes from the title of this talk from Warren Bennis that leadership is becoming yourself, which is uh, an interesting argument and so we started with that and I said to them I'd like to tell you a personal story then I would like you as faculty members to turn to each other and share a personal story and then I'd like to find out what you learn. So I'm going to share that story that I shared then I'm going to ask you to do something slightly different and make this high quality connection okay so it'll be a little more challenging for you. The story I told them was my first day in sixth grade <laughs> He's laughing because he thinks it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, I walked into class. The school teacher stood up, pointed at a kid named Ray Bell, and said, Ray Bell, 
your family moved across the boundary, you have to go to Sheffield School. And everybody went, oh. Now, the reason they all took a deep breath was Ray Bell was the best looking kid in the school. He was the best athlete. He was good at everything. And in the sixth grade, we had cheerleaders. Cute cheerleaders. All these cheerleaders loved Ray Bell, who was also the best basketball player. Now, in my calculating, I was very interested in cute cheerleaders at 12 <laughs> years old. Um, and I calculated, you know, if he's leaving, maybe I could become the best basketball player <laughs> and the cheerleaders would like me. Um, so I thought hard about this. I had four constraints. I wasn't very fast. I couldn't jump. I was uncoordinated and I was pretty weak. <laughs> Other than that, I was highly qualified. Um, but that day at 3.30, I went home, found my lopsided basketball, went to my friend's lopsided rim in his backyard, and I started shooting. And about 6.30 or 7, his mother stuck her head out the window and said, go home! So I went home. And the next day at 3.30, I was back. And I was back every day. And September went by, October, November, December came, and basketball started. And an amazing thing happened. Uh, for the first time, the coach was paying attention to me. And I started on the starting team, and then the first game came, and I was the high scorer. And as I was the high scorer the next, I was the basketball star. Now the interesting thing is that the cheerleaders were not one bit interested. <laughs> Zero, right? But something else far more important happened. I made a discovery that consumed me. It was something I couldn't imagine. I had declared a purpose to myself and I went out and worked at it with intensity and I became a new person. I found capacities that I didn't have before. And it was absolutely stunning. I could change the world. In my neighborhood, no one believed that. That was an incident of enormous consequence in my life. And um, it changed all kinds of things for me. For example, my position was point guard. Point guard's job is not to be the star, but to make everyone else better. And as the time passed, that ego thing kind of disappeared. And I discovered something that was incredibly satisfying. So I turned to these faculty members in this business school and I said, now tell your story, whatever it is, to the person next to you. So they did. Now I'd like you to think about your story. What moment in your life did you most become who you are? What was that? Now when they were finished, I said, what did you learn? Now I want to share with you what one of these people said last week. And then I'm going to ask you to pick the sentence of his statement with which you most resonate. Of all the sentences up here, which one do you care about? And then I'm going to give you an assignment based on the sentence you pick. All right? So you got to, this is important homework here. So here we go. This is what he said. What I currently believe about myself does not capture who I really am. That's an incredible sentence. We could spend an hour on that. I become myself when I'm challenged and engaged and fully focused. I become myself when I stop living in fear of what I can become. And I begin to bring all of myself to the people in front of me. I discover who I am, really, who I really am when I'm growing into a better version of myself. When my potential is being realized, I feel whole, authentic, and unafraid. My perspective changes and thus the world changes. I become more aware, I see possibility, I feel hope, I'm more courageous, I'm willing to say what I really feel and more willing to hear what others really feel. I think we could write a book about this paragraph. Now, I'm going to give you five seconds to pick your sentence. In that paragraph, what sentence most resonates with you? So you've got five seconds.
All right, here we go. Here's your assignment. Here's our high quality connection. Your job is to find somebody other than the two people sitting next to you, some other person. I want you to say to them, hi. I don't even want you to take time to tell your name. I want you to say, here's my sentence. Share it with them. What's your sentence? He shares his sentence. And then you get about 40 seconds to talk about how those two sentences connect up. What do they have to do with becoming yourself? Okay? Ready? Go. Let me get some quick input from maybe two peoples. Who has an insight that you're pretty passionate about? What did you take away from that conversation? Somebody. Yes, ma'am. The person I talked to resonated with a sentence that she's already sort of gotten there, but it resonated with her as she's thinking about helping her children overcome fear. Okay, so she's pretty excited about helping her children become who they really are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One more, yeah, way back there, nice and loud. So we had two different sentences, but it actually kind of converged into this whole idea that when your perception changes, the realm of possibility changes too. Oh, I love that statement. You hear what she said? When your perception changes, your realm of possibility changes. I think that's exactly right, and an incredibly important notion. Um, I want to tell you about an epiphany I had a few months ago. We were at a Fortune 100 company. We were doing focus group interviews about an executive program we were designing for them. And uh, a woman spoke up and said, you know, we have 1,600 executives. When I look at them, they fall into three groups. Group number one is incredibly tiny. It's made up of leaders. They're randomly distributed around the place, but it's made up of leaders. And I know they're leaders because when I meet them, I want to be like them. That's a very homely measure. When I meet them, I want to be like them. Actually, it's quite scientific, as you'll see in a minute. That's a very powerful sentence. She said, second group is huge. It's made up of a large number of people who are managers. They intellectually understand leadership, they just don't practice it. And then there's this tiny group that's so technical, they're never even going to understand leadership. Now, she took my breath away because for 40 years, everywhere I've gone, that's what I've seen, and she articulated it. It was so powerful. Since then, I've asked executive group after executive group, why is the middle group so large? The room goes deadly quiet. No one wants to talk. I just stand there quiet. And then finally, someone says, it's hard. <laughs> someone else says, it's risky. And someone else says, the culture. Those are pretty good answers. No one says it's not true. That's enormously important. 
It took me to a second image that day as part of that epiphany. And the image looks like this. Henry Ford. If I asked the customer, he would have said, I want a faster horse. That's a really important sentence. In our incremental thinking processes, we can only ask for a faster, better, cheaper, higher quality horse. We can't ask for an automobile. Why? We can't create what we can't imagine. And as I put those two images together, it exploded into what I want to share with you today. And it all starts with what we do here at the Center for Positive Organizations. 15, 16 years ago, we started this movement called, called Positive Organization Scholarship. And the basic argument that Jane Dott and Kim Cameron and I made as we brought a bunch of scholars together is that there's a bias in social science. It's something everybody thinks makes social science objective. The bias is central tendency. People were shocked when we said that. <laughs> you know, you take a random sample, you analyze it, you say, here's the pattern. Hundreds of thousands of studies, you know, following that. We said, we think there's a new bias that we should consider. What does life look like at its best? If we study an individual, what does he look like at his very best? If we study the team, what do they look like at the best? If we study the organization, what does it look like at its best? Or a topic, leadership, decision making. What does it look like at its best? We took a lot of heat, but a lot of people bought it. So in the last 15 years, we've seen lots of studies come forward using the positive lens. When I look across those studies, what I see is the following. That is, in the middle of this curve is order. On the left side of the curve is decay, breakdowns, problems. We know scientifically negative is more powerful than positive in holding human attention. When I was a freshman, I took Sociology 101 and 102. 101 was called Social Organization. He studied norms and values and institutions and answered the question, why is there order in society? Then you took 102. It was called Social Deviance. Right? You studied prostitution and mafia and answered the question, why does it break down? What's the title of Sociology 103? There is no Sociology 103. <laughs> Reality is made up of the middle of the curve and the left side of the curve. That's not a criticism of sociology, it's a criticism of how our brains work. That's where the focus is. When you stick on that positive lens, it calls attention to what happens in dynamics of excellence. And it's a different dynamic. When I'm moving from order in this direction, I cross a tipping point and all of a sudden, there's a different dynamic. It's called a vicious cycle. I do what I did previously that made things good, and it now makes them bad. So I try harder, and it makes them worse. And I can't get out of the vicious cycle. Conventional logic is no longer working. When you make the journey in the opposite direction into positive deviance, there's a different dynamic. There's a tipping point. And that dynamic is the virtuous cycle. When unlike things begin to reinforce each other and everything gets better and better and better. And you see things that stagger the imagination. Well, what is it we can't imagine? I think we have a great deal of difficulty imagining the authentic self. The positive organization and positive leadership. These are very difficult things to imagine. Let's take each one. Becoming a leader is synonymous with becoming yourself. It's precisely that simple. It's also that difficult. Why? Because I can't imagine it. That first sentence. Most of the time, when I think about self, I have a fixed mindset. I see the self as a noun. I. In that case, a pronoun. That's fixed. I'm an object. And if I'm an object, I look at you and I see an object. 
And when I see an object, I'm free to act upon it. And when I act upon you as an object, you resent it. And so objects like big houses and big boats and fast cars, you know, those are things I can act upon. They give me status, but they don't love me. And I'm left with a hole in my heart. Um, very important to imagine the authentic self, but very difficult. Here's a list that I use regularly with that first slide I showed you, that normal curve slide. This is an interesting list. You know, live in hierarchies, people live in hierarchies, act with self-interest, minimize personal costs, fail to learn, react to constraints, comply with demands, fail to see opportunities, compete for, the, for limited resources. If I asked you, what is this list? You say, sure is negative. And then if I said to you, yeah, but this is what you believe, you'd be really insulted. Let me just say, this is what you believe. <laughs> You know, you were barely able to talk. And mama said, because I told you so. And you learned about authority. And you said, I don't want to eat it. And she said, if you want dessert, you've got to eat the main course. And you learned about transactions and negotiation and hierarchy. And when these statements come from the social science. These are the assumptions of social science. What's wrong with those people? Well, they study you and I. And this is what they find in the middle of the curve. In all economics, let, let me test you. First assumption of economics, man or woman is? A rational, self-interested actor. Resources are? Scarce. Conflict is? You are good economists. There it is. And if I'm a manager and I make these assumptions, what do I do? Well, I obviously can't trust these suckers. So I got to build control systems. And so I do. And then what do they do? They get mad, resist it. That's data. That data says my theory's true. You can't trust these suckers. I got to build a better control system. And it's a self sealing logic that never goes away. It's very hard to change this. Here's a very different list. People live in social networks, sacrifice for the common good, make spontaneous contributions, experiment and grow, expand roles, craft jobs, take charge, express voice, envision possibilities, expand the resource pool. That's a very different image, isn't it? When we put on the positive lens and use science to go look at him or the team or the organization or the topic, this is what we find. What that means is, this is absolutely real. This is absolutely real. And your left brain says impossible. Those are opposites. It's either or. But the positive lens is inherently inclusive. When you make the transformation in your life, where you begin to understand the positive lens, you do not lose your awareness of constraint or problem solving. As you become a purpose finder, you can still solve problems. You lose nothing when you gain the positive lens. You only get more powerful because you can make more choices. That's shocking. It's not understandable. I was with an organization of economists yesterday in England. And they had their arms crossed. All right? And it was very interesting as the hour went on to watch the arms uncross, the eyes get big. When we find these dynamics, we find people committed to the common good. And new patterns emerge. Now, I want to take you through the notion of management and leadership. This is very important. Managers solve problems. They live in front of machine guns. It's absolutely intense all day long. They restore by solving problems, we're restoring order. That's a key phrase. They do logical analysis and then they use rational persuasion. Here's what the analysis says. 
buy my investment product. Formal authority and legitimate uh, direction. See, I hold a position, I'm the boss. It's legitimate for me to tell you this. And it's about making hard decisions, being decisive, and getting measurable results. Now the interesting thing about that is the manager is an extension and a preserver of the culture. The culture is a very powerful collective expectation system and it governs. And what managers are doing are preserving the culture. The culture is inherently a self-preserving mechanism to start with. In contrast to that, we know from science that there are four factors that make up transformational leadership. Transformational means I can change the beliefs of one person or I can change the culture, the collective beliefs. That's what leaders do. They make the world better by changing belief systems. And there are four things that predict that. The first one is individualized consideration. My boss knows me and cares about me. Number two, idealized influence. This is the hardest one to understand. My boss models virtue. Selfless, committed to the common good. Models virtue, attracts me to that virtue. That flies in the face of all economic thinking. The kind we learn from mother. Violates our paradigm. Inspirational motivation. My boss connects me to a desirable future. And I'm starting to believe in it. So I'm acting in a new way. I'm shooting more baskets. I'm becoming something new. And in facilitating that, the fourth factor is unfortunate label, intellectual stimulation. What it really means is constantly challenging my thinking. Why do you believe that? Why are you making that assumption? Why do you think that's impossible? My leader is empowering me to think and see in new ways and to own my own thinking. Not making me dependent upon him or her, but freeing me. And when I put those four things together, it says a leader is separate from the culture and a creator of the culture. Leaders are blowing up the culture all the time in order to make a better culture. That means they're creating conflict in order to make the world a better place as opposed to problem solving. Leaders also have to be managers. Both and. Again, highly consistent what we know from science but very much outside our conventional thinking. So what is management about? It's about obtaining knowledge and skills. This cathedral that you're in right now is built to the God of knowing. When an MBA walks in here, the first two minutes, they make a discovery. I need to be on stage every minute. I need to look smart. Otherwise, they're going to look down on me. And for two years, that never ends. And then you get a job and it gets worse. Because <laughs> in that cathedral they worship the same God. And so we have professors who are very smart and they generate knowledge and they say, hey, come to me and I'll give you this knowledge, you can turn it into skills. And we call that leadership development and it's not. Leadership development is becoming yourself. More specifically, it's about obtaining moral power, attractive power, idealized influence. And that's unthinkable in this cathedral. We don't even know how to talk about it. So she says, oh, we only have a few executives that are leaders and then we have all these people who are managers. Why? Oh, it's hard. It's risky. Culture. What an interesting thing to put together and think about. So what can we not imagine? We cannot 
imagine or advocate the development of attractive moral power. Sounds like a small statement. I think it's huge. Let me try to defend it. What's the current approach to leadership development? Well, research tells us that it's all about knowledge and skills and there's a 15% return on investment. If you come to us and give us a few million dollars to, to uh, train your 60 top high potentials, you get a 15% return on investment. That's pretty good. There's a significant correlation given that. It's a weak correlation, but significant. Leadership training actually does have positive impact. But what about the other 85%? There's something we call the Bunday problem. You know, Kim Cameron and I can spend a week, in fact, in this very room, <laughs> with groups of executives, and they eat up positive organization scholarship. They sit on the edge of the seats for five days. And we say, what are you going to do when you go home? Oh, they say. <laughs> that gets really scary. Because they know on Monday morning, there's going to be 500 emails waiting for them. And an angry boss. And two dissatisfied clients. And, and the list goes on and on. And by Monday afternoon, they can't remember Kim Cameron. Or Ann Arbor, Michigan. They're back in the real world. Now the interesting thing about that is that culture eats leadership development for breakfast just like it eats strategy for breakfast. <laughs> Those 500 emails are the beginning of that process. That suggests something absolutely paradoxical. The culture of the organization which says go develop leaders destroys leadership development. It eats it up. Why is that middle group so big? Because, well, let me just stay with this for a second. Um, effective leadership development. In 1977, we got the first theory that was very controversial. And basically, we were told, you're not a leader until you're twice born. And twice born meant some kind of discontinuity, usually a crisis. Why? Because when you have a crisis, when your partner says, I don't want to live with you anymore. When your boss says, I'm sorry, it's a downsizing, you're gone. The doctor says, I'm sorry, it's cancer. Those are traumas, aren't they? What happens to us when we do that? We have two natural choices. We make a fist or we get in the fetal position, fight or flight. The third way is called post-traumatic growth, learning. And what that means is because of the crisis, I clarify who I am and what I value. Identity and destiny. And the moment that happens, I get out of the fetal position, I start to act, I become empowered. That's the birth of leadership. That's what takes us out of that conventional paradigm. Um, you know, that's a, in the last 50 years since they proposed that, it was very controversial to start with, it's pretty much confirmed. That's the way it works. And it's not very helpful if you're an HR director. <laughs> right? Becoming a leader is synonymous with becoming yourself. Your best self. Your dynamic self. Your growing self. Well, the research in recent years has shown there's another way as well. It's all about examination of identity and destiny in a very deep way, deep learning. I can get there through the first path, which is crisis, or the new second path is disciplined reflection, new experiences and disciplined reflection. I have experiences, I think about them. I reflect deeply on them. And everybody walks away from that saying, ho oh, hum. It's actually profoundly important because most people don't think. We say, I want a new horse, faster horse. That's incremental thinking. That's not deep thinking. That's not transformative thinking. In fact, um, this is a great quote from Malinsky. Most people do not accumulate a body of experience. Most people go through life undergoing a series of happenings which pass through their systems undigested. 
Happenings become experiences when they're digested, when they're reflected on, and related to general patterns and synthesized. He's talking about deep learning from experience. That's highly consistent with the more recent research and it opens some interesting doors. I want to give you some quick examples. Um, someone sent me a blog. They said, you're going to love this. I read it and I did love it. It was written by a woman who's a journalist. She described interviewing a consultant who was a very interesting character and he told her a story. He said, when I was about to graduate from high school, my grandfather said, I have something for you to do. After every lecture in college, I want you to take 60 seconds and write one simple sentence about the most important thing you learned in that lecture. That's it, period. He said, I've done that. It was so powerful, I've kept doing it. After every meeting, every important conversation, I do it. And then I synthesize the things that I write down. She was so fascinated, she decided to try. She has three paragraphs describing all the positive outcomes and then says, but I know why no one does this. It's hard. She's saying that discipline reflection is hard. Well, I did love it because when I was 19, I was in a situation where I could only fail. And one day, something out of nowhere came and said, keep a notebook. And after every conversation, after every interaction, I would write a sentence or two. At the end of the week, I'd have 20 sometimes, and I would shrink them down to seven or 11 or five. And I just kept doing that week after week, month after month. And all of a sudden, one day, I went out and for the first time succeeded. I had an internalized theory of action based on personal reflection. It was in my bones. It affected me the rest of my life. Very abbreviated version of this one. The uh, Kim Cameron gets up and gives this incredible lecture on research on gratitude. It's so influential that many people in real time say, I'm going to start keeping a journal. I listened to that lecture, I never did anything. <laughs> One day, I'm talking to this woman, and she says, I had a journal, gratitude journal for 18 months, and then I quit. And oh, she said, no, I've got to explain to you. She said, my father was the most negative man who ever lived, and I was his daughter. If I went to a concert and there was one bad note, that's what I talked about. But then I bumped into this research, and I started keeping a journal, and in three days, I could see a change. She said, I quit after 18 months because I now live in a constant state of gratitude. Now the interesting thing is that people who know her the last 10 years, I've only known her for a year prior to that moment, when I say her name, they roll their eyes, they say, oh, the black hole. I've never heard her say one negative word. She was telling me that her brain was rewired. I was so impressed, I went home and started keeping a gratitude journal. Take some moment of yesterday, record it, and then write, as you write it, you, what you see is you see it explode into something deeper. Deep learning takes place. Over time, it becomes, you see patterns. That's deep reflection. Now, Sue Ashford, I saw walk in somewhere, she will tell you that there's a study been done to help you understand all this, where they did an experiment and they said, you can spend 15 minutes in a quiet room doing nothing but thinking, or you can have a mild electrical shock. <laughs> <laughs> the result is the majority of the people choose the electrical shock. shock. <laughs> we do not want to do this. That is so important. Well, we want to do a little experiment with you. In trying to put all that together, part of that epiphany was a new strategy. So I spent the summer making 100 video clips, three minutes each. Each one is a story, a parable, 
that's real about leadership. And we're putting a program together in executive education, the production process is about starting to move fairly rapidly, and I think will be done in probably early February. Um, but basically the way it works is it's 100 days of leadership development. Every morning you get an email and there's a three minute clip attached. You watch the clip and then you ask two developmental questions. As I consider this clip, what principle of leadership comes to me? Not what did Quinn say in, in the three minutes, but as I listen to myself and my conscience, what principle of leadership comes to me? Principle is a very important notion. The reason the conventional mindset works is because we're all context driven. We make political compromises. We condemn the politicians while we imitate them. Moral power is about living higher principles. When we live it, we gain it. Second question, what am I willing to do today to more fully live the principle of leadership? I'm going to let you do this. I'm going to show you the first clip. As you watch this clip, I want you to answer these two questions. One, to me personally, you, what principle of leadership occurs to me as I listen to my conscience, and what can I do today to begin to live it more closely? You ready? All right, let's see that clip. I was visiting a Fortune 10 company. We were designing a leadership development program for executives. We were doing focus group interviews. I sat there through the first two hours of various focus groups and said nothing because I was looking for something. With five minutes left in the last focus group, it suddenly came to me. I finally spoke up. I said, I'd like to ask a question. If you answer this question, you'll probably shape the program we're designing, but you'll probably also alter this company. Now that caught their attention. I said, here's my question. What is the one thing that keeps you from being a great leader? The moment that I signed it, two people asked a clarification of the question. And finally, one woman spoke up. She told the story, she spoke from her heart. We went around the table and everybody did the same. I wrote down what they said. I went home and I looked at that sheet of paper for hours. Why? Because on that paper was authentic data. I made sense of it. I made sense of it. I reduced it to four categories. And basically those categories were the following. One, how do I change the beliefs of that guy over in the next silo? How do I get them to cooperate with those in pursuing the common good? Two, how do I change the beliefs of that monster who's my boss? How do I get him to let me do the thing I think is right? Three, how do I get my people to fully trust me? Finally, how do I get myself to do the hard things I need to do. Now, across those four categories, there's a common denominator. The denominator is belief. How do I change the beliefs in the next Bible? How do I get my boss to change his beliefs? How do I get my people to change their beliefs? How do I change my own beliefs? Now, that's a tremendous challenge because you and I know what's right. And over time, what we know is right becomes dysfunctional. If we are fully conscious, and aware, and learning, we're constantly discarding the old beliefs and replacing them with new, more powerful beliefs. Two days later, I sat with the CEO. I told the CEO that story and said, I think that story tells me what it is you're trying to do. The CEO said, what's that? I said, you're trying to turn a knowing company into a learning company. The CEO almost came out of the chair. He said, that's exactly right. You see, that's what every company needs to do. Every organization needs to do. The natural inclination of human experience is to rely on what we know and to avoid the work of learning. Leaders are engaged 
in the process of learning constantly. And one of the things they're learning is how to make it possible for other people to learn. Okay, write down your principle of leadership. What is it? And what can you do today to live that principle? Go. All right, if I can interrupt. My guess is there's very little overlap. Very different principles written down. And very different actions written down. And they're customized to you. And you just controlled what those were. Um, so basically the way this program works is there's a daily clip like that one. And then those two questions. And you're asked to do what you just did. Then at the end of the week, you're asked to do a quick review. I set five objectives. I said I was going to do something. What was most successful? As you look at your five experiments. You write that one up in a paragraph and you share it in your digital community. That is, you don't do this alone. Let me talk about that. Um, in that digital community, it can be grown in an organic way. Someone can come here as an executive, take an EE course, go home and say, I'm going to do this with my people. Let's design this together, the ten of us. Or it can be done in a very different way, a designed way, at HR or CEO level or whatever it is, saying, we're going to do this as an entire organization. Go through those hundred cues together. So on the fifth day at the, at the water cooler, we're talking about the story from the morning. It's now part of our culture. Um, we could do that in any number of ways. We said we're going to do it in this division. We're going to do it with the top executive team for 20 days and then we're going to stop and evaluate what's happened and then they're going to design it for this division or that unit or whatever it is. There's an infinite way, number of ways to slice and dice that design process but there's an invisible transformation that follows. It's very hard to see, but very powerful and important. If you start to do that, if you have those digital communities and you're sharing, leadership development transforms into cultural change. As you share your successes, you say, well, I wrote this principle, and on Thursday, I went and confronted the boss. And John reads your paragraph. And John says, Becky confronted the boss? She can't do that. But if she did, maybe I could be more courageous. And what happens is contagion. Virtuous contagion. People seeking the common good, going outside of their political fears, and now we have cultural change from the bottom up. It's not controlled, it's not designed, it's not handed down. We have people leading. And we have random patterns of goodness coming up the system. That process is emergent. And we never think like that. So what's this all about? I see the following payoffs 
in this process. One is for the participant. I get to own my own leadership development. The organization is not going to do it for me. It can't. They can do a lot of management development, but they can't even conceive of what we're talking about. It's not overwhelming. You know, five minutes a day, 100 days, to get me started. And that may turn into a habit. Now, for a bunch of people, it's not. They're going to quit. I'm going to say, this is not for me. But there's also a bunch of people who are going to stay with it. At the 100, end of 100 days, where are you going to be? You're going to be into deep learning, into creating new experiences, reflecting on them, and becoming who you really are. We're going to change that middle group. For the company, instead of spending $60 million on this huge leadership program for the high potentials, for a very small amount of money, $300 a person, I can reach huge numbers of people in my company. Um, I can deal with the Monday problem. If I'm an HR person, I can now say to the CEO, not only go to spend the money to send them to Michigan, but when they come back and they hit the 500 emails, we have a way to get them to really grow. That's a big return on investment. Um, I can reach many and I can create positive change in this organization. This is an organizational phenomenon. That turns the HR person into a hero. For our executive ex education people, this is something they can do with every client. People in public programs, people in, in our custom programs. We can take it out of exec ed and go to the alumni of this school, undergraduate, graduates. It's a very wide application. Now what's the vision? My vision is this. At the end of three years, if this is successful, I want to reinvent it. I want to eliminate Quinn and bring in the stories of all the faculty, the very best stories, and maybe it's 200 stories. I don't know. In other words, we're going to make it better and sell it not for $300 a person, but $1 a person. Because we want the process to go to every supervisor, every manager, and every executive on the planet in Africa where they can't afford it. I want it to go to North Korea, to China and Russia. Why would I want to make them better? Because as I look at what's happening every single day, we are moving headlong into disaster. We get smarter and smarter and more technologically powerful and it's just a matter of time. The only hope we have for this planet is to move people quicker into true leadership, into moral power and concerns for the whole. And so my desire is to see that go to everyone. Um, we're out of time, so I'm not going to have you do that closing exercise. But um, I just want you to know this is something I'm very passionate about. I have enormous hope that at the Center for Positive Organizations, we can start a process that spreads across this planet and makes a huge difference. I hope that there's some ideas that have come to you personally about what you might do for yourself and beyond yourself. And if you want to share those ideas with our Center for Positive Organization people or executive development uh, people, we'd love to hear them. So I wish you the very best. I hope there's some value in your hour here and that it makes a difference in your life. Thank you very much.
Bob, we have a token of appreciation for your talk today. Very inspiring. It's a positive spiral because you are a person <laughs> that's always creating and energizing positive spirals. If you haven't gotten enough of Bob, he's going to stay on and do a companion workshop. We'll take a break and come back in about 10 minutes for that. Come back in January. We have Raj Sisodia, the co-founder of um, Conscious Capitalism with us. I think it's going to be a great talk. That's on January 29th, back up on the sixth floor of our um, Ross building. So with that, uh, take a quick break. Those of you that have to leave, those of you that you can stay, we'll get started in about 10 minutes with that. Thank you. Wonderful, Bob.